And I googled like styles, crazy styles, and that picture came up, so that was my title slide. So my name is Mike. Uh, this right here is Millie. That is Dexter, who is a new puppy, half lab, half golden retriever, and he is a whirlwind of terror, but he's so cute. Mike, Millie, and Dexter. I work for Lullabot. Lullabot is a content strategy slash design slash development company. We are one of the first Drupal agencies from like 2006-ish, and we work on like large Drupal websites, believe it or not. Um, so, in the beginning, uh, we created the W3C created CSS. So, as we get started here, who here is a front-end developer? Who here is a back-end developer? Who here is just hanging out? <laughs> a couple of you. So we created CSS and we saw it was good, right? Because you can change your colors, you get your fonts. Sometimes it gets a little bit weird, you know, because you get like some colors mis mi mix matched, but they're close. And sometimes it gets kind of shitty, you know, <laughs> and because we have, yeah, initially we had to do the layouts with tables. So I want to talk a little bit about CSS variables here. Now CSS variables are different than SAS variables. So who here uses like SAS or less or pre-processing or something like that? Yeah. So who here has used CSS variables before? This is awesome. This is really cool, right? So I'm gonna, so um, obviously this is a SAS variable right here. And uh, you can, as, as, the, the way that SAS works, oh no, wait, my, <laughs> as SAS works, it will com it will actually generate the CSS. But once that variable is set, it's kind of set throughout the whole process. Um, so meanwhile, in 2010, Nicole Su uh, Suther Sullivan um, proposed a CSS variables um, specification, and as of a couple of years ago. All of the major browsers now support CSS variables. The, so Internet Explorer 11 does not support CSS variables, but I'll tell you how the polyfills work with, with that. So it's actually called not really CSS variables, it's called CSS custom properties, right? And the reason why that's important is because they work in place of a custom property right here. As of right now, you cannot use like your uh, variables, your CSS variables, as like say like a pixel value in your media queries or anything like that. That does not work. So this is basically it right here. All custom properties are prefixed by double hyphens, and the reason why they're double hyphens is because they didn't want anything to conflict with SAS or less. You know, you could it could have easily used something like a dollar sign, but at that point. Um, you know, SAS wouldn't know what to do with it. So this works, of course, with SAS, and you know, it's I I personally use it with um, I use a mixture of SAS variables and CSS variables. So um, basically, right here, put those necklaces down. You're making tons of noise, Millie. Um, so we're creating, on this root element up here, we're creating a custom property called color. And on that custom pro so we have that set to the hex value of badass, right? And so right now, <laughs> we are, w within this block, we are setting the background to this color. You can see how we do it. We have this var function, and then we just call it the custom property. And that works like straight out of the box. That's part of CSS, uh, CSS specification. So there, there's a couple way, like what we're doing for the hover state right here is we just change the custom property. Now, of course, we could change the background property or we can change this color property. But you can kind of see, this is, this is a very basic example of it, but you can kind of see, like, it can get kind of powerful, you know? So in, in this case right here, Um, we are doing that, and you, we can also use your custom properties inline right here. So this gets uh, pretty powerful when you're using like componentized, like like you're using maybe React components or something like that, and you can affect these directly in there. It's it's pretty cool. Um, 
So there we are with that. You can, oh, oh sorry. So this is, we, CSS variables also allows uh, a default value. So for example, if the color is not set here, if the color custom property is not set, then it will fall back to this orange value. And of course, you can set your fallback to be another variable if, if you so desire. Which brings me up to this meme right here, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So uh, you can do um, at supports. Is everybody familiar with what at supports is? At support, well, if you are not, so an at supports is kind of like a media query, but it's, it says, does the browser support this? So you can put at supports display grid and it will only evaluate to true if display grid is a value, uh, um, a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a real value for that property, if the browser supports that. So up here you can, you can do, you can do at supports for CSS variables, or you can use not CSS variables in there, and you can kind of set your properties that way too, if that's important for you. Um, so what are we doing right here? So this is like a kind of a more um, complicated, I'm gonna have to do this way, really. Uh, this is a more complicated situation right here, where we have, so we have the max width to, well, so, so this is what, sorry, this is what doesn't work right here. So uh, the media query right there where it says max width, and then you have that container in there, that does not work. Now, there's a issue for Chromium, for Google Chrome, to make that start working. So that might work in the future, but as it stands right now, it does not work. Um, let's talk about anim animating between uh, different custom properties. So with, with CSS animations, which are like using like at keyframes and you have your animation name and stuff like that, you, you can animate to the value of your custom property, but you cannot animate the custom property itself. So this right here, you cannot animate the value of the custom property, but you can animate to the value of the custom property. Does that make, kind of make sense? So that's just something to keep in mind. So of course you can use uh, you can use your CSS variables or your CSS custom properties anywhere where you would use that custom property. So for example, right here we're using it inside the help function. So in this case right here, this is kind of a um, this is kind of like a more complicated. Uh, situation right here, and what it does is it's setting the it's setting the width, height, font size, and background. Well, the width, height, and font size, it's setting all of that based on the size value right here. So we're using calc, and we're using kind of a fixed aspect ratio for this. Now, previously, when you when when you were using fixed aspect ratios, you could use like the padding top hack and stuff like that. But with this, you don't have to do that anymore. You can set this. Do you have a question? Yeah, this is basically smartphone versus PC sizing. It could be, yeah. It, it definitely could be. You know, and maybe like keep like 16 by 9 ratio depending on the size or something like that. This is a this is a uh, use case for that. So you can kind of you can kind of maybe get like a little bit of an idea on how that's working. We have the default size up there set so 15, so it's going to be larger. But then maybe in the block one right here, it's going to be smaller instead of size six. But because we have that size in here, and it's you know multiplying itself by you know set of fixed values in there, it's going to be larger or smaller, which is pretty cool. So I'm also going to talk a little bit about CSS grids. So CSS so CSS variables are kind of easy to understand. They're um, the concept is pretty straightforward, but there's a couple caveats. Like I talked about the animation and the fact that you can't currently use them in media queries. CSS grid is a little bit more complicated, right? Um, so let's get into that. So a long time ago, of course, 
we use tables for layout. Has anybody ever done like layout with tables and stuff? I used to do that stuff. And actually, it was like pretty easy. You just draw it out using Dreamweaver, cut some holes, and it would work. Sometimes you had to use like multiple nested tables, and you put your spacer gifs in there to make sure it was spaced properly. Eventually, you know, we're trying to move to CSS-based layouts, and we started using floats. You know, you can see how I'm using Dreamweaver here, but there's floats. <laughs> and um, so, like, floats got, like, a little complicated because you would float stuff to the right or to the left, but then the container wouldn't stretch to cover the child element, so you'd use stuff like clear fixes, if, if, if you're familiar with those. And it got complicated pretty quickly. And you had this, like proliferation of grid systems to make stuff really easy, right? So you have like all these crazy grid systems, this is maybe, I never even heard of that one, I just kind of Google grid systems and started peeking out the <laughs> logos and stuff like that. And what you would do is you would just like add CSS classes to the items, you would say span 12 or this, and that, or you know, if you're using SAS, you could, you know, add and include span 12 and stuff like that. And it made like some really, really ugly markup at, or CSS classes, or CSS values at time. And it was, a lot of times it was very, very hard to troubleshoot, but it was solving a problem. It was making layout with CSS easy. And layout with CSS has been pretty, pretty difficult. What's up? Sure. And then you also had a uh, proliferation of like, like articles like this, the 13 best response to CSS grid systems for your web designs. And it's like, what do I have to do here? Do I have to like seriously evaluate all 13 of these grid systems only to make a decision so I can do my like CSS layout? And then we got time for that, right? That's horrible. That's that's horrible. So, CSS grid. Get into the meat and potatoes of this uh, of this talk right here. CSS grid is awesome. It is. This. I mean. Does, does everybody here know Flexbox or is a little bit familiar with that? Remember when you were learning Flexbox, you're like, what the hell is this? This is like very difficult. You have to justify stuff and you got your different accesses and it's very hard to kind of initially understand. CSS Grid is actually easier than Flexbox. It's newer, but it's easy. So this is like the uh, set of, uh, you know, markup that we're going to be exploring right here. It's pretty basic, right? You have a parent item called grid, and then you have some sub items called grid child, and like that's as easy as anything works, you know. So initially, we're going to talk a little bit about grid parent syntax, you know, which is basically the syntax that you would apply to the parent grid. Everybody got that so far with us? Cool. I, I have. Um, I'm going to go through a bunch of these properties and a bunch of. Um, a bunch of uh, examples here. And so I have like some links up right here and they just basically link to some code pens. So you can like go to the code pen, you can start screwing around and you can start messing around. Like the easiest thing, the, the best way to do uh, CSS grid is to obviously start messing around with it and start working with it. So uh, you want to start using grid. The first thing you do is you take your uh, grid parent right there and you just do display grid. That's pretty straightforward. I want to set up three columns here. So you, grid template columns is the uh, uh, property name. And then I want to set up three 200 pixel columns. That's pretty straightforward, right? Everybody's yeah, it's nodding. Yeah, this is this is about as easy as it gets. Um, you could do the same thing for rows. So grid template rows. If you want three rows, you could do two two hundred pixels three times. Uh, by default, it's set to auto. Auto is just like it'll you know resize based on the content. Kind of straightforward. Is that uh, for the rows? Is that talking about the height or? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Exactly. And um, so there's like some shortcut syntaxes in here. You know, like for example, like uh, you could do the column, or wait, the rows, columns. You know, so instead of two properties, you could do, you do one property, right? That's, and it's kind of, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so in this case, what we're going to have is we're going to have 
three 200 pixel columns with four 50 pixel rows. And you also have what's called the repeat syntax, which is a way to, of course, uh, make your code a little bit more concise. So instead of typing 200 pixels three times, just say repeat three times 200 pixels. Kind of straightforward. And you can use that like along with other like pixel about other columns. So in this case, this will create one 300 pixel column and then three 200 pixel columns. Everybody following so far? It's, is this easier or more difficult than Flexbox? It's easier. Yeah, I think it's a lot easier. You know, and you, you start messing around with it. It, it, it is easier or more difficult than floats. <laughs> yeah, right? Floats were kind of difficult and really weird. And table-based layouts, if you're coding it by hand, it's way easier than that. So you have grid gap. So grid gap is, believe it or not, the gap between the grids. Right? <laughs> so it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory here. I'll go through it anyway. So uh, grid gap 20 pixels. So you get, so instead of setting like maybe margins or paddings to space your uh, your items next to each other, you just set grid gap, and you can do 20 pixels, which is you know we'll set both the vertical and horizontal grid gap. 20 pixels, uh, 40 pixels will do. I guess the 40 the 40 pixels will have the is the rows, and of course you have these properties right here, which uh, are kind of self-explanatory, right? So how does that interact with uh, margins? Uh, margins, I believe, are inside of that, and I do not believe that th there is no like collapsing of that. You know how like margins will collapse; they will definitely not collapse into that. So min max is kind of neat. Getting into like a little bit more complicated gritty stuff here, but basically it sets the min, the minimum, and the maximum of the row or the column or something like that, right? So in this case, we have one 200 pixel column. That's always going to be 200 pixels. And then you have three columns that is going to be either between 100 pixels or 200 pixels. And how is it going to determine where exactly that is? It's going to do its best, basically. It's going to try to fit into the parent container. You know, if the parent container is like over larger, it'll be 200 pixels. If the parent container is narrower, it'll be 100 pixels. It'll also look at the content in there. If you have more content in one column, that one might be a little bit larger. But you know, it'll always be 100 and 200 pixels. And is that implemented differently by different browsers? What's that? The Max. Uh, is it implemented differently by different I haven't found that it was. Okay. You know, that being said, like Safari is always a pain in the ass, you know, but um, I, Grid has been, in my experience, I've used it in production twice now. It's been um, fairly consistent across all browsers, um, with one exception where Internet Explorer technically supports Grid. But it supports a very, very early, early version of Grid. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. Question. How does this work with like, overflows? Um, it depends on how you, how, you, how you, so like what, it depends on what's overflowing, you know. Um, so text will, of course, wrap. It'll push it out to 200 if it can and then start wrapping. Um, as far as specific cases, um, yeah, and like you 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 had said some you know on the previous slide you had said like row heights and stuff like that and I assume that it'll just stay static at that or, or yeah so then the text what happens it just goes away or can you put like an overflow scroll or something like that or that's a really good question honestly I, I haven't done that I'd have to like play around with that I'm, I would assume it would be like it, it would just default to the overflow property which I think by default is visible so I'm guessing the row would be like you know forty pixels and then you would you would see the text below that. That's that's what I would assume would happen. But I, you know, that's the type of thing. Like, like I said, like I've been playing around with Grid for a little while. I've used it in production twice, but I always double check stuff, and you're learning it. You know, um, it's real, it's new enough where I don't know everything. You have a question? The min max you're saying 
know, theoretically, I mean, like if it goes down and changes the size, each one of those columns could be different widths. Yes. Know? Is there no way to equalize those or they pay all the same no matter what? There is. There is. And you, if I, if I was giving away prizes, you would, you would earn it because that was a perfect segue. So we have the FR unit right here. So the FR unit is basically a fraction unit. And what the fraction unit will be is it will, like each, it's, it's kind of a made up unit and it's always gonna be equal, right? So if you have, um, if you have your, if you have four columns and you set each to one FR, it'll always be 25%. And if you set one to, um, if, if, if I set a column to two FR, and then another column, uh, another two columns to one FR, y'all have a 50% column, and then a um, two 25% columns, which you can. Put them in max in there? Yes, you can. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I get the next prize. Hey there. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, before we do that, let's talk about autofill. Uh, yeah, so there's autofill and autofit. <laughs> <laughs> That's alright, I, I got lots of distractions over here. <laughs> I, um, so, like, autofill will basically put in as many columns as it can, as many 200 pixel columns as it can within the container. So, if the, if the container is 900 pixels wide, it will put in, you know, four containers. And then there will be a 100 pixel gap at the end, right? But, of course, you can use min-max with your FR units and your, and, uh, yeah, your autofill, min-max, and FR units. And what it'll do is it will autofill as many 200 pixels columns as it can. But then, if there's a little left over, it will automatically fill it up to fill out the whole thing. Does that kind of make sense? And that happens every single individual cell within that row expands to the same. Level. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's pretty neat. So you can see, like right here, we're getting a little bit complicated. But if you if you lead up if you lead up to it, it's, it's not terribly complicated, right? It gets more complicated as we go in there. Like there's weird, and I'm going to talk to you a little a little bit about like syntaxes because for there CSS Grid has probably like six syntaxes to do one thing, which to me is like kind of kind of uh, complicated. When I've been using it in production, just because it is new, I've been just doing long, longhand, you know, because part of being a good developer is to make your code re readable and understandable to people that maybe might not understand some of this stuff. So you got grid auto rows and grid auto columns. Um, so grid auto rows and grid auto columns specify the height the track size of the auto-generated columns and rows, and um, they can be in any unit, including FR units. The initial value is auto, which sets the height equal equal to the largest content items. So, go ahead. Can you do min and max in that as well? Yes. Yes, you can, which is pretty neat. Um, so, Masonry layout using grid is pretty cool. So does anybody know what masonry layout is, kind of, right? So it's like you got like bricks and they might be different sizes but they fit together and stuff like that. If you do that now, uh, you have to use JavaScript. And there's jQuery plugin called like, uh, there's a jQuery plugin called C uh, CSS Mason, or J JS masonry or jQuery masonry or something like that. There's a bunch of them that, that do very similar things. And, but with, um, with uh, CSS grid, it makes it really easy. So you just do grid autofill depths. It takes everything to fit stuff in there. It takes a little bit out of source order, but it works. And so this is like so cool. I'm gonna bring up and I'm gonna show it to you here. Oh man, I'm having trouble seeing it over here. Let me do command F1. Uh, so grid links, masonry. So this is like maybe like the default thing. You can see there's some holes in there. 
you can see that I have like a bunch of grid children. Some of them are spanning two, some have heights of two, and all of that type of stuff. So if you're if you're working with this, typically you have to use JavaScript to calculate everything, move it around, maybe absolute position it, and stuff like that. And it's kind of heavy. You might have a flash of on style content and all that. But all I have to do is just enable this one uh, this one trick, right? And then, bam, it just works. And of course, this is CSS, no JavaScript, native in the browser, quick like that, no flash about style content, really cool. Still no way to do like a Pinterest-like layout, so you can't do it like really weird like that. Um, but uh, you can do stuff like this pretty easily. And that's going to move around as responsive. Oh yeah, yeah, it's totally responsive. So if, if I were, I don't, did I make the, yes, yeah, so I have the width set to 100%. So if I were to, let me change the view to uh, full page. You didn't oh. save it. Yeah, I didn't save it. Sorry, let me go back to editor and save it. Save. So once we, so you can just see it's kind of just working. Pretty neat. Um, let me get it back to the way it was. Because if I don't do it now, I will totally forget. Command F1 back. So yeah, pretty neat, huh? So those um, were all the CSS properties that you attach to the parent element. So of course there's all types of different properties you attach to the child element because you might want your child to start on a certain column, you might want your child to span a certain number of columns, and all that cool stuff, right? So let's talk about just aligning tracks, right? So like you can imagine, you know, like we have a width of a thousand pixels up here, but you can see there's gonna be a hundred pixels left over, you know, and uh, where do you want that item to end? You know, your item to exist in that, should it like be in the center, be in the middle, go to the end, stuff like that. And you, you, you can use, so align items is like a flex box thing. This is, it's not, Oh, no, yeah, uh, justify content. What is it? Justify. Yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, a line, there's an aligned content that always screws me up, too. Um, but you can kind of get the gist of how that works right there. So um, I want to start a child. I want to put my, column, my child item on a particular column or somewhere. Grid column start, too. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, so what, by default, what will happen is if this is the first uh, item, the first child, it will start on two, and then of course the next ones will be in three and four and stuff like that, and leave a gap there unless you have that auto flow, grid auto flow depths. And you can have it, of course, span multiple columns, right? So you can kind of see, you, you, a lot of this is kind of almost self-explanatory, but you can see where I have grid column end, and I can set grid column end to a certain value. I can say grid column start five, grid column end and eight, and it will go between five, six, seven, and eight. Or I can set grid column end to a, I can have span a certain number of columns. So five, six, seven, eight is four, so I can do span four, and it will span a total of four columns. Kind of make sense? So you can kind of see how a lot of this works. It also works for rows, too. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of shorthand syntax going on right here. So you can just put the uh, little forward slash in there. And so grid column two, four. So um, starts on two, ends on four. So you got two, three, four. And so it should actually be like spinning three there. Two, three, four, I should change that. But um, yeah. Same thing with rows. You know, I want my I want my grid child to span multiple rows. Just put span two. And of course, you can say I always want this grid child to appear 
in the second row. Uh, I remember like one of my first Lullabot projects was uh, the Sci-Fi Network, and we were doing the masonry layout. Uh, so we had, you know, like a bunch of like weird size, you know, kind of bricks. And then we would always inject this uh, banner ad right, right below the first row. And then, of course, we would put more in there. But it needed to be responsive. And sometimes there was four columns, sometimes there was three columns, sometimes there was two columns. So I had all this crazy JavaScript that would detect it and like, re like refactor and redo everything. And it was such a pain in the butt. If we had CSS Grid for that, it would have just been done immediately, and it was it would, it would have been so much nicer and more performant. So something that's kind of that, that's kind of useful, and I do this a lot, is use negative numbers for your grid columns. And what negative numbers do is it starts counting from the end. So it's basically the same thing, counting from the start, counting from the end. So you can use things like this to have it span a full width, you know? So say if I have an eight column grid, I could say like grid, grid column one slash eight, but what if, you know, someone changes it to a 12 column grid at a different breakpoint or something like that? Well, if I do one slash negative one, it will do from the first column to the very last column. And uh, then you don't have to worry about changing that in media queries. Um, you could also do, of course, like, you know, if you want it in the center, you know, you could do two slash negative two. You could, you know, figure that out. Kind of makes sense? Pretty cool? Yeah. Is anyone, like, super excited about this? I, 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 I am too. So what are we doing here? Putting a child in a certain column and having it span multiple columns. That's pretty straightforward. I think we already did that earlier. But yeah, so, this is starting in the second column in spanning two. So this will go from column two to column three. And so now we're gonna into like some of like the little syntax changes. You know, like I said, there's like 27 ways to do a single thing. So you have what's called grid lines and then grid areas, right? So imagine, if you will, you have a grid and you have lines on each of the grids. You have one at the very left, you know, which I guess your left is over here. And then, um, you know, you have your first track and then you have another line. You have your first track, you have another line, stuff like that. You can name those <coughs> lines. You can name those lines and then reference those lines later. And that could be cool because you can change the placement of those lines based on your, uh, based on your breakpoints. But then on the properties where it's just naming the lines, it will follow wherever that is. So um, I haven't used this in production because to me it's like kind of an over abstraction. I could see maybe in like some certain types of like product situations, it might be nice where you have like maybe a designer who's doing some light development and they just know I want this in my content area, I want this to go from content start to content end. To me, like it kind of made it, it, it makes things a little bit too abstracted. But then again, I'm still kind of learning this too. So let's look at this. So we have grid, co uh, grid template columns, and we have the line on the left is going to be called content start. Then we have one fr, and then content end. So that basically means we have a grid. There's just one column, right? So at 700 pixels, we're going to do uh, a one fr column. And then we have content start line, three FR columns, so that would be 75%, uh, 25%, and then you have content end. And then you can just have your grid child go from that, and of course it'll just kind of automatically shift over without having to put any media queries on your grid child. So where does content start, content end define? Um, right here. See where you name them? It looks for the brackets. Oh, okay. Make sense? I guess I could be like drawing this stuff out on the whiteboard. But, the, but does, does anybody kind of understand that? The hand waving and stuff? So if like in this media query you've got here, if the, that one FR was a sidebar, could you do sidebar start before one FR yes. and then do sidebar end and then side and then content start? I don't know. It's a so good question. You know, like this is sidebar, this yeah. is content? Uh, yeah, yeah. L l like I don't know if you could have uh, a name line no. that's or, or two name lines right next to each right. other. You might be able to. Uh, I, I, like I said, I haven't used this functionality a lot. It'd be easy enough to mess with, though. So. Yeah. 
So it's all relative and you don't have to calculate anything. Exactly, especially with like the FR units. You know the FR units are equal factors? Yeah. So we also have uh, what's called named areas. So like a named area is, is um, basically just like, you know, your content, your header, your sidebar. And you can actually like start writing like what looks like your grid in your CSS right here, right? So that kind of, so, so you can see the grid up here, we just have a one column grid where we have header, content, sidebar, footer, header, and then we have header, header, sidebar, content, footer. And w what we do is we assign children to the, uh, to the area. And I think we do that on, uh, at the very top. So you can see I'm assigning the header, to the grid area header, and I can uh, assign my aside to the grid area sidebar. And I have this all set up. You might be wondering, well, what happens when I'm minifying the CSS, you know? So I'm minifying the CSS, it'll preserve like at least one space for the white space, and, that, and that'll work. So when you're looking in your developer tools, you will see like all of this, but it'll be on one line, and it's very confusing. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, like I said, I, I haven't used this, in, this syntax in production just because of that. I think it's like a little bit of an over abstraction. So we're doing something a little weird down here where we have a dot in there. And the dot just means leave that blank. You know, so you can see that little dot. Now, of course, I, I, I'm ha that could be one space or multiple spaces. Um, it'll all kind of figure it out. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah. A little bit complicated, because it gets more complicated. <laughs> so you, you can see we do like the grid template shorthand. Th th this isn't the complicated part. So this, you know, this creates four 50 pixels rows and three 200 pixels columns. I think we already discussed that earlier, but uh, you might have stuff like this where we're using grid areas and that. So like. The reason I'm bringing this up is if you're looking at someone's code and you see that, imagine like all on one line, you're going you're gonna to be like, WTF is this? This doesn't make sense, but it seems to work. And then you have to like reverse engineer exactly what's going on and you have to kind of wonder it. But now that you know that this exists, this will like maybe give you a heads up. So what of course we're doing here is we have your regular grid area stuff where we have like, you know, the head at the top, sidebar, you know, uh, a two column main area and then another sidebar. And you can say we're, um, I'm assuming this sets the row value first. So we're setting the rows to each 200 pixels and then we're setting the, uh, the columns to, no maybe, oh man, I'm confused right now. That's <laughs> yeah. So in this case, you go to MDN and you would find an example and you would look it up exactly. But it's important to know that this exists. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so should you be using CSS Grid, right? So CSS Grid is also uh, supported in all the major browsers, uh, including Interact 411. But Interact 411 is almost like worse because it's kind of broken, right? Because it, it supports an earlier version of CSS Grid and it supports, and it doesn't do what you would expect it to. Um, you can kind of see, you know, <laughs> little poop emoji right there for NX411. But I want to talk about like how I dealt with this. So I used, um, we did a kind of landing page redesign for uh, the host company Pantheon's website, and then we also are using CSS Grid on the lullabot.com homepage. The way that I've been dealing with it is I use this media query. So you can see it says screen and MS high contrast active, MS high, high contrast none. So MS is obviously Microsoft. This media query right here is only um, a thing in Internet Explorer 10 and Internet Explorer 11. So if you use this media query, it's going to target those particular browsers. I don't we don't support IE10, but it will support that. 
So what I do is I'll open up, um, you know, I have a virtual machine with IE11 in it, and I open it up, see what's broken, and then I start setting my max width on that, and I start just using Flexbox. And you, you can, yeah, I mean, you can do everything, of course, in Grid that you can do in Flexbox, so, or you can do everything in Flexbox that you can do in Grid, almost. And you can make it look pretty good. Like, there's obviously going to be like some weird stuff where, like, say, for example, like if you're doing like the grid auto flow dense, you're not going to be able to do that with this. But what you can do is you can maybe use Flexbox to make everything look equal, and then the people still don't know it's broken. It just doesn't look as cool, you know, or, or, or something like that. But, like, that's, that's kind of important because, you know, hey. So just remember that that's up there and available. And so, as for my last slide, I, uh, I just Googled thank you and I took a screen cap of it. It says, thank you. So, thanks. Uh, any questions or anything? Yes? Have you, uh, you said you use this in production. Mm -hmm. Have you combined it with anything like Bootstrap? Or no, no, I haven't. And, and in my opinion, like I've never been like super big on Bootstrap, but it does, it does a good job on, on like, you know, with the grid. But if you're using CSS grid, you can see to use it and make complex layouts, you don't need to use all that crazy like grid area stuff. You can do very complex layouts with simple syntax, which to me negates the need for CSS grid or for bootstrap grid. Yeah, but what if you have a project that has, it's like our school's website, I it's, you need I would not migrate any website to CSS grid unless you have a need to it. Like CSS grid is, um, I mean, it doesn't support as many browsers. And if you're if you're talking about schools, a lot of schools do use older computers, older browsers. Some of those teachers, you know, they might not be the most technical savvy. So if they're if they look at something and it's broken, they're going to blame you. And you know, I, I for a situation like that, I would only use it like really when creating new sites, unless you have a specific use case. Um, have you, are you using this with Drupal 8? And if so, are there any things that didn't work or problems that you ran into? I haven't, I haven't personally used it with Drupal 8, but that being said, it's CSS. You know, it's markup and CSS. There's not going to be any, as long as you got, you know, the appropriate markup and the appropriate CSS files includes, it's going to work. At the end of the day, it's just a big text file that your browser reads. Yeah, it seems like you'd have to replace a lot of templates and get the right classes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it all comes down to making the markup look the way that you want it to. And Drupal is a pain in the butt because, you know, you have a lot of nested markup. And to do that is, is a pain in the butt. There's a new um, CSS property coming down that's not, I don't think, implemented anywhere except for maybe like the flag in Chrome, where you can just have like the, the containing element inherit the grid from the uh, parent element, and that's going to make like our use case a lot easier. But I mean, you do have to, of course, manipulate the markup to make it what you want. But that's just part of part of our job, right? So, what are the things that he's super, super excited about CSS grid? I don't know. It's just like ease of it. it, it yeah. like, like once you learn it and you start like uh, prototyping in it, it's just like really, really rapid. You know, and, and it seems to have like a good number of same defaults. You know, the, the grid auto flow dense is pretty cool, but that's like a specific use case. But everything else it just makes it easier. You know, I wish they had this like when I was learning, because I would I would I would have not like How probably threw my time? computer against the wall several times. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I got one more thing, and I promised this for Millie. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Everybody stay. <laughs> Millie and I made, made this website, and it's a little soundboard. That's good. I told her I did. <laughs> I told her I would do that. All right, that's it. Ta-da. <laughs>